Thank you to our, our youth bells for sharing their message and music with us this morning. Typically, I'm pretty good at, uh, at waiting. I, I kind of pride myself on good waiting skills. I can handle the, the doctor's office, not too bad. Dentist's office, well, a little different than the dentist's office. But, but uh, in general, I'm a pretty good waiter. I can uh, wait. That's not wait tables, but, you know, waiting for, uh, for something to occur. To occur. Um, how about you? Is that, is that a gift for you? Can you, you wait well? Is, uh, are you got patience? Um, there are times, though, that even the best of us who are able to wait, um, come upon moments when it just doesn't, uh, doesn't go well. Even for, the, for, the, for someone like me, I, I have my moments where the waiting gets a little bit too delayed and uh, I can get frustrated just like anyone else. This morning in our scripture reading, there are ten bridesmaids and they are caught in the age-old wedding problem of having to wait. Wedding guests are always waiting and, uh, and some deal with that better than others. Um, in the time of the Bible and in the time of uh, the telling of this story um, for the early church, uh, the, the idea of a wedding and, and what was going on in a wedding is different than it was for today. At least most couples don't practice weddings the way they did in biblical times. In, in the Bible, they waited because they never knew when the groom was going to show up for the wedding party. It was by design. It wasn't because he was lazy. It was just that's, that's what everybody expected. There was a, a time in which there would be arrival of the groom and sometime during the day or night a messenger would run through the streets announcing that the groom had arrived and we were ready for the party to, uh, to begin. Um, and he would come and then the bridesmaids uh, were supposed to be ready for that moment and they could be left behind or, or miss the party if they weren't ready at the right time. If you're your bridesmaid, you had to be ready and prepare for the moment at the right time. Uh, and so notice that in our scripture reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. Jesus told this story, then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed and all of them became drowsy and slept, but at midnight there was a shout, look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all of, then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came, also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Thanks be to God for this reading of the Gospel of Christ. Have you heard the refrain from uh, Tom Petty's uh, kind of famous song, The Waiting? It comes to mind as you're reading the parable, the pride's made, this waiting moment that uh, has to occur. You, you, uh, you probably remember that Tom Petty um, and his distinctive voice, even if you don't know much of Tom Petty, he died early in October. Um, he could add a third syllable to the word waiting. That's, uh, that's how good he was. At, uh, here, here, take a listen. If you haven't heard Tom Petty, you can indulge me for a moment. Yeah, the waiting is the hardest part sometimes. Even for those of us who are good at waiting, it can be the hardest part. Notice how he could drag out waiting. There's a third syllable in, uh, in waiting. I don't know how that's possible. Well, the story of uh, the bridesmaids um, certainly brings to mind the fact that uh, preparation in the Christian life is something that we should be about. Uh, preparing even for our, our waiting 
moments. Be prepared is what the story is about. Be prepared, be alert, be on your toes. Um, in general, life is filled with surprises. Preparation has its place in the Christian life and in living in the way of Christ. Preparation is so important these days. We were reminded uh, this, this past Sunday um, in a big way uh, in that, uh, that church shooting in Texas. How do you prepare for, uh, for such a thing in the, in the church? Our hearts go out to the victims and the perpetrator of that crime. Um, what, uh, what was going on in, uh, in his life and what was going on for those people as they, they uh, dealt with that, that tragic uh, circumstance? What could have been done? We, we briefly discussed it at our trustee meeting this past Tuesday. We were talking about, uh, you know, what... What preparation do we have in general for emergencies that might take place? You know, fire, is everything kind of taken care of? What, uh, what preparations should be made for, for emergencies? We've got a lot more to talk about. We uh, reached out to the, the fire chief of the volunteer fire department, um, Rick Childs, who's a member of our congregation, asked him, you know, what, what kind of preparations uh, should be made for just emergencies in general. Um, we want to have a, a safe place, a safe sanctuary um, for, for all in, in, uh, in our community. Um, it takes preparation. Got to be ready uh, for any circumstance that may present itself. You might call it active waiting, readiness while you're waiting. David Loos reminds us that uh, not all waiting is the same, right? So you got to prepare in different ways depending on what you're waiting for and what uh, may come up. The birth of a, of a, of a healthy child, that's a different kind of waiting. Um, the, the closing on the house of your dreams, the promotion in a job, the acceptance from college, it's a, it's a lot different waiting for some things than others. Some things can be harder to wait for. Waiting, for instance, uh, to, to the time of, of uh, being pregnant for the first time, if you've been having trouble being pregnant, or the foreclosure on a home, that's a different kind of waiting than, than looking forward to, uh, to having uh, owning a home. The doctor's uh, waiting for the doctor's report, the diagnosis that you're waiting for, that's often a difficult time and, uh, and has a different preparation for waiting. Whether you're waiting for something good or bad, it takes a, a different kind of uh, anticipation for the arrival and the delay that can get lengthy in some circumstances. It almost always brings anxiety. Even to those who wait well, it brings anxiety. I can tell you that firsthand. I still get anxious when I'm having to wait. Why haven't I heard from the college admissions office, you know? Why, why, why can't they get back to us on a quicker rate? Have, have they uh, arrived safely, you know, the loved ones coming for Thanksgiving? When, when will they arrive safely for, for the family gathering? When we hear from the doctor, the waiting indeed is the hardest part sometimes. The obvious tragedy in the parable is, is for the, the five bridesmaids that took no oil. Took no oil, no extra oil, and they've been waiting, and now it's, it's coming towards midnight, and they had no extra oil. Um, they, they just didn't bring any. It's not that they ran out, it's that they didn't bring any extra, right? So they ran out of what was in their lamp, um, but they didn't bring any planning beforehand. No planning for if this was going to be an extended delay for their waiting. Surely there's something to learn here from those five bridesmaids that didn't prepare uh, for the delay of the arrival of the, of the groom. But less obvious, but also poignant, is the tragedy of the five who brought flasks of oil, but they wouldn't share. That, that kind of gives me a rub. I'm like, what's up with not sharing? I mean, you go to any child care provider, talk to any mom, they've been teaching sharing from the get-go, right? So they're trying to get their, their toddler to share because that's a tough time to be one who shares. That's, uh, that's, why don't these bridesmaids share what they have? They brought some extra oil. Why, why aren't they willing to share with, uh, with others? The announcement of the 
bridegroom or the groom is, is eminent and the arrival has already been sounded and they're not willing to share a little bit of oil to extend the opportunity for these other five to be a part of the, the banquet. Can we also learn from the ungenerous bridesmaids and not force people to wait alone? Um, why, why aren't they in it together, the ten? You know, you want to see some solidarity of effort uh, amongst them. So no one in our communities uh, should be isolated from the experience of being locked out. Why would anybody be locked out? There's a little bit of a rub for me in the five bridesmaids that, that make the wedding party. So it brings me to the conversation between the, uh, the five bridesmaids that are called foolish and the five that are called wise. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no, there will not be enough for you and for us. You'd better go to the dealer at midnight. Go to the dealer and find some oil. Like a dealer is going to be open for giving oil. It seems so harsh, so harsh by these five maidens that they don't share. Check with any of the child care providers that you know and see if that, that's going to fly. Couldn't they give just some oil? Is there ever a time when the wise thing to do is to follow this lead, to not share? When shouldn't you share? When can't you share? Preacher Will Willimon uh, tells the story of, of a time when he was a young pastor. Uh, he called upon a grieving young woman. She wasn't a member of his church, but they had attended, she and her husband and, and, uh, and little baby had attended the church a couple of times, and after they had attended a couple of times, as was their custom, he would go and visit them and, and uh, make a phone call and reach out to them, and so he got to know them a, a little bit, but uh, even after the rest of the church kind of tried to warm up to them, uh, they, they only attended a few times, and then they stopped coming altogether. Nobody exactly knew why they didn't connect, but uh, they did didn't make a connection with the congregation. Coming home from a business meeting, the young man, the, uh, the husband, um, was involved in a tragic automobile accident and he was killed in the accident. And Williman was called by one of the church members to let him know that this had occurred. And, uh, and so Williman rushed over to her side um, to, to hear and to listen uh, to her story. Um, she was, of course, terribly in uh, a large amount of grief and sorrow at the, at the moment when Williman sat next to her on the sofa and she asked the question that so many people ask in a, in a tragic situation like that, why would God do this to me? Why would God punish us in this way? Is this some sort of punishment? I'm left here with uh, an infant child and uh, all alone. How, how would Williman answer such a question? I've had that question asked of me and, and people facing a health challenge or a grief uh, after the loss of a loved one. Such questions are understandable in the moment. Um, it 